All right, so it's 7 p.m. Eastern time, so we're going to begin shortly. So before we start, I have a couple of notes that I want to share with everyone. First thing is there's a bit of a delay between when I do and say something and when it is visible on the live stream. So for that reason, uh, to avoid disrupting the flow of the talk, I'm going to address all the questions at the end. That being said, feel free to ask questions at any time throughout the talk. You can just post them in the comment section and I will uh, just address them towards the end. Uh, I wanna thank you all for coming to Cosmos from your couch for tonight. And I hope that we can provide some entertainment uh, for you. Uh, so I can get right into it. And I can tell you that today's title is Weighing the Universe with a Balloon Born Telescope. So my name is Shaban and I'm gonna be talking to you about this peculiar sounding title. And it is a weird sounding one. So the structure of today's talk will be breaking down this title essentially into parts. So I'm gonna start by answering the question, why is it that we care about weighing the universe? Why is that something that the scientific community cares about and why people are interested in it? After that, I'm gonna address how is it that we weigh the universe? How is that something that we could do? And finally, I'm gonna address the balloon part of the title. Uh, and specifically, I'm gonna talk about an experiment called Superbit, which is an experiment that I'm part of, that I work on. And you know, it's exactly what you're thinking. It's a telescope hanging from a giant balloon, but more on that later. So let's start by asking, why is it that we care about weighing the universe? Why is that something of interest? And to answer this question, I think it's important to take a step back and ask a series of slightly more fundamental questions. You know, questions like, what is the universe made out of? How much stuff is in the universe? What is the universe? And you know, these are not easy questions. These are fairly hard, fairly big questions. And there's no easy way to just answer them. I mean, I could come out here and just give you some facts, uh, but I think it's a lot more informative if we try to look at it from the perspective of an experimental scientist. And I'm gonna to try to do that today with an interesting analogy. So for now, I want you to set the universe aside. Let's forget about the universe for a second and let us talk about the jelly bean game, right? So I'm sure most of you have encountered this in one form or another. It's a fairly popular game that you see in fairs and in you know, carnivals. And essentially what it is, you have a jar and the jar is filled with jelly beans or lollipops or bubble gum or some sort of candy. And people go in and guess how many jelly beans or how many uh, lollipops are in the jar. And the person who guesses the number that is closest to the true number of candies in the jar gets some sort of prize. And you know, that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna simulate playing the jelly bean game together, except we're going to play like my dog Balu would, like a scientist. That's my good dog, Balu, good dog Balu, and he's gonna be a scientist today and he's gonna come up with three experimental ways we can figure out how many jelly beans there are in the jar. And he says, hey, I know how I can get some treats. Here are my three experiments. So the first class of experiments that Balu could do is that he could count, he could open the jar and just count the number of jelly beans. You know, one jelly bean, two jelly bean, you know, like the count. Another thing that Balu could do is he could weigh the jar of jelly beans and he knows how much each jelly bean weighs and then he can divide the total weight of the jar by the weight of a single jelly bean to get uh, the total number of jelly beans in the jar. And finally, we could use the energy content of the jar. And in the case of food, you know, energy is just calories. So we can figure out the total number of calories in the jar, and we know how many calories each jelly bean is, and we can use that to figure out how many jelly beans are in the jar. So let us simulate these experiments, you know, we're, Let's imagine here that we're conducting these experiments. So first we go on and we conduct the energy experiment. We look at the back of the jar and we read that there is 100 calories total in the jar. And we know that each jelly bean is exactly one calorie, I wish, but let's assume that they're one calorie per jelly bean. Uh, so we now know that there are 100 jelly beans in the jar, right? 100 calories, one calorie per jelly bean, that's 100 jelly beans. All right, so we now move on to our next experiment and we weigh the jar and we find out that it weighs approximately 30 grams total. And we know that each jelly bean weighs approximately one gram. So we deduce that there are 30 jelly beans. Interesting, that's peculiar. That's not, it's not consistent with what we just saw, but you know what? We're good scientists, so we're not gonna jump to conclusions until we're done all of our experiments. 
So we're gonna move on to our final experiment and we're gonna open the jar and count the jelly beans one by one. And we're gonna count them and we find out that there are only five jelly beans that we counted. We take them out one by one and we only took out five before the jar seemed empty. So this is pretty interesting. You know, what, what does this mean? We conducted three experiments that logically should tell us the total number of jelly beans in the jar and all three experiments disagreed. So at this point, we have to make an assumption. You know, we can assume that, you know, let us assume that these experiments were done properly and are trustworthy so that we can trust all three results. You know, and obviously we can't have 100 and we can't have 30 and five all at the same time. So we're left no choice but to make the following peculiar deduction. And we deduce the following. In the jar, there must be five jelly beans that have energy, have weight, we can see and we can touch. Namely, those are the five jelly beans that we pulled out of the jar. All right, okay. Additionally, there seems to be an, another 25 jelly beans that have energy and have weight. We saw them when we weighed the jelly bean, but we couldn't see them nor could we touch them when we put our hand in the jar to count them. Finally, the majority of the jelly beans in the jar, 70 jelly beans total. We couldn't see, we couldn't touch, and we also couldn't weigh, but we found them by looking at the calories, by the energy in the jar. And you know, to avoid getting lost, we're gonna give those types of jelly beans names. So we're gonna call the first class of jelly beans matter jelly beans. And then the 25 jelly bean class, we're gonna call it dark matter. And the final class, we're gonna call it dark energy. And here's the interesting part. You know, this, this, is, this is the point at which the analogy ends because we essentially do the same thing with the universe. When we're asked the question, how much stuff is in the universe? We, we do similar classes of experiments. We look out and try to measure all the energy in the universe. We look out and try to weigh the universe. And finally, you know, you look out with your telescope and you count the stuff you can see in the universe. And we get the same disagreement and we make at the end the same deduction. And that means that 70% of the contents of the universe, the absolute majority of the contents of the universe are made of this mysterious substance called dark energy, whose physics and origins are both presently unknown. Additionally, another 25% or so are made of an equally mysterious entity called dark matter. So together, that means 95% of the universe is made out of things that we don't understand their origin or their nature which is why the nature of dark energy and dark matter are two of the most fundamental and important questions in modern science. I mean, let's take a step back and I mean, think of this implication. This means that everything we can see and touch, you know, the planet, your family, yourself, the stars, the galaxies, everything that you can see only accounts for 5% of the contents of the universe. So I'm hoping that at this point I've convinced you that you know, probing the nature of dark matter and dark energy is a fairly important question in science. But what does that have to do with weighing the universe? Well, it turns out that the nature of dark matter and dark energy highly depend on exactly how much there are. So you know, we said that there were 25 or 30, you know, jelly beans that are dark matter and five that are matter, but you know, if we weigh the universe, is it, is it exactly you know, 30 total? Was it 31? Was it 29.6%? And it turns out that that matters, right? This tells us a lot about the nature of those two mysterious entities. Additionally, the nature of those entities also depends on how the weight in the universe is distributed in space amongst the universe. You know, is the universe equally heavy everywhere? Are there parts of the universe that are heavier than others? You know, is it symmetric? Uh, and it turns out that, you know, you can learn a lot about these entities just by studying the weight of the universe and how it's distributed. So hopefully you're thinking right now, all right, great. Weighing the universe sounds super useful, but how the heck am I gonna do that? It's not like you can just pick up the universe and you know, put it on a scale. And unfortunately you're right, you can't just put the universe on a scale. However, you can do a couple of things. Uh, there are actually a few methods that you can use to weigh the universe, but I'm gonna focus on just one method called lensing. It's my personal favorite method, so it's the one I'm gonna talk about. Uh, and it goes as follows. So first we have to note an interesting fact, which is you know, the way gravity works. So gravity in essence works as follows. You have 
an object that has mass that has weight and this object bends the space around it. You know, and, and here's a GIF that I found that sort of illustrates that, you know, you have objects that have weight, you have a heavy object here and a slightly less heavy object and they're bending the space around them. And the heavier you are, the more you bend the space around you. And in this example, you see that the heavier object is bending the space enough that the smaller object is in orbit, kind of like, you know, the moon and the earth. So we've established that gravity tells us that heavy things bend space and the heavier they are, the more they bend space. But that also means that light, you know, if I have an object like a star that's radiating out light, as this light passes by a heavy object, because the space near the heavy object is bent, the light is actually going to bend as well, right? So because the space itself is bent, the light will curve in its path. So what does that mean for us? How is that useful? How does that help us weigh the universe? Let's, I'm going to illustrate how this is helpful with, with a, um, a live example. So let's look at my beautiful artistic rendition of a star and a telescope. So, you know, the way you see things or, or you know, things either radiate light or reflect it. And your eye, or in this case, your telescope, collect this light. And that's how you see an object. So in this case, we have a, a circular object here that's radiating light rays. And the light rays get to you, you see them, and you see the object. Now, imagine the following. Imagine that I take a fairly heavy object, and I put it, boom, right here between me and the, uh, and the source. I put a heavy object. As we just discussed, the heavy object will bend the space around it, which will in turn bend the light that's coming from the source to my telescope. But the interesting thing is, is that how much the light bends actually depends on how close it is to the heavy object. The light that is closer to the heavy object will bend more. So in this case, the light coming from this side of the object will bend a lot more than the light coming from this side of the object. So let's, you know, let, let's do a quick look back there. Bam. You see, so this light bent a lot more than that one. And what this means is what, for my telescope, is the circle is going to be a little extended. By the time it gets to me, by the time the light arrives here, it's going to look like an ellipse instead of a circle. Which means that I could use this, you know, I could, I could look at how the shape has changed. It used to be a circle, and now it's an ellipse. I can use this change in shape to determine how much the light is bent, which helps me determine how much the space is curved, which helps me determine how much weight there is between me and the light source. So in essence, by measuring the shape of an object in the sky and, you know, understanding how much a shape has changed, that gives me a measurement of all the weight and all of the mass between me and the object. And I think at this point, it's fairly important to mention that this is not just some, you know, random theoretical prediction that I'm just spouting that has never been observed. This is a fairly well-documented and observed phenomenon. In fact, here is an image of an exaggerated version of this phenomenon. So what you're looking at here is this blue ring here, this is actually a blue galaxy. So it's a blue light emitting object. It's very far away. And between us and this blue light emitting object, there's a lot of weight. You know, for example, this red object right here, there's a lot of heavy things. So as the light comes, it curves so much. The space is so curved that the light bends so much that instead of looking like a normal galaxy, like these ones over here, instead of looking like that, by the time it gets to us, it looks like a ring, right? You can see it right here. And you know, even in this image, you can actually use this change in shape to determine how much weight there is between you and this light low object in the background. And again, this, I caution, this is a very exaggerated effect. This is rarer than you'd normally see. Most of the time, the shape change is fairly subtle and you have to do you know, some, some math to figure it out. This, this is just a nice image of, of a rare event of and a fairly exaggerated version of this effect. So at this point, you might be thinking, okay, that's good. I, I now know how to weigh things in the universe. Do I just go out and, you know, randomly look everywhere and weigh everything? Or are there things that I'm more interested in than others? And the answer to that question is, you know, kind of both. You do want to look everywhere and try to get as much mass between you and background objects as you can. 
but there are objects of specific interest. For example, an object of specific interest to me and the collaboration I work on is called a galaxy cluster or cluster. So this here is an image of such cluster. So the reason these objects of our specific interest, so remember the mysterious entity we talked about, namely dark matter, uh, there happens to be a disproportionately large amount of dark matter in galaxy clusters compared to the rest of the universe. So not only that there's a lot of dark matter there, uh, it also turns out that how dark matter behaves and its nature can be uncovered or studied by studying how the weight of these clusters vary as a function of position. Like for example, is it heaviest in the middle? Does it get lighter as we go outside or is, does it get, you know, or does it get heavier as we go outside? Is it heavier here or there? So if we, you know, weigh these objects and uh, study how their weight distribution uh, behaves like, we get to learn a lot about the nature of dark matter. And I think it's important to, to understand the scale of this object that I'm showing you. So, so I want to highlight a little bit of things. So a cluster has, you know, these bright objects you're seeing there, which are, are called galaxies. And there's about a thousand of those in a cluster, right? So let's highlight one of them right here. This is just an example of a galaxy. There's, a, there's normally a thousand of a thousand galaxies or so in a cluster. And each one of those galaxies has about a hundred billion stars, right? So this is what a galaxy would look like. We're kind of zoomed in. This is a cluster. It's a galaxy. We zoomed in. It's a hundred billion stars in there. Each star is, you know, give or take maybe the size of the sun. And here's the sun. Here's to scale image of the sun and here's the earth. The sun is about a hundred times larger than earth. This means that these objects, these clusters of interest are one with 16 zeros after it times larger than the planet earth that we live on. You know, everything that we experience every day, the planet, that's it's one with 16 zeros times larger than that. You know, and I just, I just think it's, it's extremely humbling and, and it's very, uh, telling to, to think of these scales. It's very interesting. So, you know, at this point now, we know that there are some objects out there in, in the sky that are of interest to us to weigh, and we know how to weigh things. I think it's time for me to address the balloon part. You know, I promised you balloons. You're probably thinking, where are the balloons? So it's time to get to that. So I'm going to be telling you about an experiment called the Super Pressure Balloon Born Imaging Telescope. Uh, we shorten it to Superbit. And all Superbit is, essentially, is a scale to weigh the universe, right? We just agreed that we were interested in weighing the universe, and all it is is a scale to weigh the universe. So if you've been paying attention thus far, you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, Shaban, I feel scammed here. You just told me that all I need to weigh the universe is look at objects in the sky and study their shapes. So why do I need some fancy, you know, balloon-borne space telescope to, to do that for me? And you know what? That's a good question. So to illustrate the importance of having such an object, I want you to do a little bit of, a little bit of an experiment with me. So I want you to take out your phone and I want you to turn on your camera. Okay, so I'm turning on my camera and then I want you to stick out your thumb and aim your camera at your thumb. Now, I want you to take a picture of your thumb, right? Boom. And then I want you to start shaking your camera and take another picture, right? So try it. And once you've done that, I'm guessing that you see, you'll see something that looks a little bit like this. So these are two images that I took previously. This is the image of my thumb normally, and this is the image of my thumb with a shaky camera. And I'm hoping that we can all agree that these two pictures do not look the same. And you know, it becomes very apparent that the shape of an object in a picture highly depends on the shakiness of the camera or the telescope taking the picture. So if you know, if, if as I said, the, the, these effects and shape changes due to the weight between us and the object we're looking at are fairly subtle, then we're gonna be very sensitive to the shakiness. You know, any slight shake will induce, you know, fake data in our, in, in, in our data set and will you know, potentially give us a wrong weight. So how do we handle this? Well, we use a, a camera stabilizer, right? So this here is a cute gift that I found of a uh, uh, it, film industry standard type uh, camera stabilizer used for like action shots. 
to make sure that they get a nice crisp image. And, you know, as you can see here, you, you see the, the person is moving it around and the camera is still locked and barely moving. And, you know, essentially that's what you need. And that is basically what Superbit is. Superbit is a telescope that is connected to a very fancy telescope stabilizing system. All right. So how does this stabilizing telescope system works? Let's you know look at it with a little bit of detail. So to understand how Superbit works, we can we have to look at a little bit of its, about it, at its structure. So you know obviously Superbit has a telescope which is used to take the images of the sky, and then this telescope is attached to a small frame called the inner frame. As you can see right here, it's highlighted. And then this inner frame is attached to a slightly larger frame called the middle frame. Don't worry, I'm going to get into these a little bit more later. And then this middle frame is attached to an even larger frame right here called the outer frame. So we have telescope attached to inner frame, attached to uh, middle frame, attached to outer frame. All right. And each one of those frames can only move in one particular way. So it can kind of do a dance. So here's the frames highlighted. So now highlighted in red is that inner frame. And this inner frame can only move along this direction right here. It's called pitch. So it can just do this. This is the motion it can do. That's it. As the telescope is attached to the inner frame, then the telescope will move with the inner frame. Now, we have the middle frame highlighted here in blue, and it can move in what we call roll, which is like that. You see highlighted here by the blue axis. And since the middle frame is attached to the inner frame, which is attached to the telescope, then the entire system can also move like that. And then finally, we have the outer frame, which can move in what we call yaw, which is like this. And again, since it's attached to the middle frame, which is attached to the inner frame, which is attached to the telescope, then the entire system can move like that. And the reason these frames can only move in these very specific you know, dances, these very specific motions, is because it turns out that practically any perturbation, any motion that Superbit can experience, that the system can experience, can be undone by a combination of these three dances, you know, these three movements, our pitch, roll, and yaw. These are called the Euler angles. So a combination of these movements can undo these, these disturbances. So essentially what we do is, is we have a suite of sensors attached to Superbit that sense the motion of the system, you know, any disturbance to the system, any motion coming in, whether it's, you know, like someone poking it, some wind or some vibration. And these sensors then tell the frames about these motions. And the frames, you know, there, there are computers that tell these frames exactly how to move to undo these motions, ensuring that the telescope remains as stable as possible. In fact, Superbit's image is so stable that it's equivalent in stability to threading a needle from a kilometer away while keeping the thread hovering without touching the edges for half an hour continuously. And that for me is a mind blowing, it's a remarkable level of stability. And, and you know, the fact that that could even be achieved, I think is, is amazing. And that is it, that's essentially what Superbit is. It's a, it's a fancy telescope stabilizer that gives you this phenomenal level of stability on your image. So I think now is a good time to talk you through what a balloon experiment launch looks like. I personally only had the honor to be on one launch, which was a launch that happened in September 2019 out of Timmins, Ontario. Uh, and it basically went as follows. You know, step one, you take inspiration from up and you tie your experiment here, super bit, to a small helium balloon. And this balloon is filled with just enough helium to make sure that, you know, this experiment superbit is essentially weightless. And then you take your superbit and your small balloon and you tie them to an even larger balloon. So as you can see it right here, you know, here's a zoomed in, here's a zoomed in image. And here is the zoomed out image. You see this large balloon. And this large balloon is 400,000 cubic meters in volume. That's 15 million cubic feet. So if you don't like meters nor feet, uh, that is 16 million beer kegs. So there are 16 million kegs of beer worth of helium inside this balloon. That's a ridiculous amount. So you fill this balloon up 
And then you wait on the launch pad nervously. And then when the time comes for launch, you let the big balloon go, boom. And then it slowly rises up, dragging the entire system with it. And here's an interesting image that I really like. So when the system is fully stretched out, it's you know almost two thirds the height of the CN tower. And this would be like the, the experiment, the gondola system here, and here's the big balloon. It's it's it's, it's phenomenal. So you know you've now launched the experiment, and you rush back to your ground station. So this is the Superbit team, you know, getting ready to tune Superbit and control it. Basically, essentially driving the experiment from the ground. You can see us all really stressed, getting ready. Uh, and you basically sit there and, and and make some minor changes while you wait for the experiment to get approximately 35 kilometers above sea level. Once it gets there, you know, you can take some pretty pictures like this one. This is a beautiful image that we took. Uh, but this image wasn't actually taken in the 2019 flight. It was taken in an older flight in the 2016, uh, back in 2016, a test flight from Texas. But the reason I'm showing this image is because I'm about to show you something fairly cool. So pay close attention to this part here of the image. Boom. See what happened? Small little square. So the reason I chose this image is this little square here is the same image or the same object imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope. And the reason it fits so comfortably inside a superbit image is because the superbit field of view is approximately 36 times larger than that of Hubble's. And you know, that's I think that's pretty cool. And but you know, you might be wondering why is it so large? And the reason it's so large is so that superbit could take an image of one of these clusters we talked about, it could take images of clusters in one go. In fact, here's an image from 2019 flight that I was just talking about of a cluster. This is a, this is a cluster. This is a real image taken during the 2019 flight. Uh, and you know, I think it's, I think it's phenomenal. It's extremely beautiful and fairly informative. But you know, all good things must come to an end and all things that fly must land. So eventually you land. And because we were in Timmins, Ontario, you land in a foresty area and which means you probably hit a couple of trees on your way down. As you can see here, the trees aren't necessarily very gentle. You know, they don't care if you're a expensive experiment. They don't discriminate. Uh, but that's fine. We expect that. You know, we know that we're going to spend some time refurbishing and fixing this up after each flight. But it's still depressing nonetheless. And as you can see here, you end up with a fairly large percentage of your electronics in the trash can. It's, it's pretty sad, especially if you're a grad student like me. Seeing this, it breaks your heart. But you then head uh, back to your station and start packing up. You pack up your experiment, you put it in a U-Haul, and you drive back to Toronto, or you fly back if you're in Texas. And that's pretty much it. That's what a campaign looks like. And you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. So I think with that, you know, we, we've, I've pretty much covered everything that I wanted to, to talk about about Superbit, but I think it's a good time to, to do a little bit of a summary of the most important points that we went over today. So the first thing we talked about is that 95% of the universe, 70% you know, dark energy, 25% dark matter, give or take, uh, is composed of mysterious entities that we don't understand, right? So that means that you know, their nature is an extremely important question in modern science. But then we found out that their nature is highly tied to the weight of the universe and how the weight of the universe is distributed in space. We then found out that we can weigh the universe by utilizing the fact that gravity and heavy objects bend space, which results in light bending when they pass them, which results in shapes changing. So we can measure how shapes change to weigh things in the universe. After that, we learned that there are giant objects known as galaxy clusters that are you know, informative and useful to weigh. We then learned that shakiness can uh, change shapes and therefore it can uh, contaminate this type of data. And finally, we learned of this super cool experiment called Superbit that flies on a balloon and stabilizes a telescope to take these images in order to weigh things in the universe like clusters. And with that, I would like to thank the amazing Superbit team that I've been working with. Phenomenal, phenomenal people I've had I, I feel very, very privileged to have met these people and worked with them. Thank you all uh, for, for all these efforts. Uh, and you can see my amazing Photoshop skills here. Uh, this was one member who wasn't around for this image. 
Uh, but yeah, and, and with that, you know, I'm happy to take any questions. We have a an Instagram account. If you are interested in seeing more images of Superbit, I know my boss would be very happy to uh, to get more followers. Uh, and yeah, that's that's everything. I'm I'm happy to I'm happy to take any questions now. So um, um, because of the lag, I'm, I'm waiting to, to see the questions uh, that will be sent over by the individual coordinating this, this stream. Which by the way, great thanks to Alana and uh, Mike Reed. Okay, so here are the questions. So I'm gonna start with a, uh, a question from Santiago Tomasi. And the question says, how do you know the original shape of a light source? You know, once the light gets to us, we assume that the light has curved, but how do we, we take into account all the mass in between us and the light source? That is a great question. So what I gave here is a little bit of a cartoon image. In reality, you actually don't know the original shape of the object. And because of the change is actually fairly subtle, it's often hard to tell whether an object even changed. So the way we do it is you don't actually look at a specific object. You look at a field of many, many objects. So you look at like, multiple objects in the background. And what you do is, is you say, okay, for example, I might not know the shape of one object, but I know that on average, the objects will look like a circle. So if I take all these objects and find what the average shape is, then I can use that to determine the mass between us and these objects. So you're totally right. It is, it is, it is practically impossible to know the shape of the specific object before the light had bent, but you know you can do some statistics on multiple objects to try to mitigate that. All right. Uh, another question we have from Sherry Suchery. Sorry if I'm butchering this name. Uh, Hello from Australia. How long did it take to build the balloon-borne telescope? That's a, another great question. So, uh, initial design, I believe, of this tele of, of the specific Superbit system began in 2013. There was a test flight in 2015, uh, an additional test flight in 2016, one more test flight in 2018, and then finally the test flight we just did in, in, in 2019. These together were test flights to ensure that the system works properly. And now in 2021, we're anticipating a, our final and long duration flight to actually get data that will be used primarily for science, not just for testing the system. Great question. All right, the next question is from Parveen Zainab Fatima. Sorry again if I mispronounced the name. Another great question. Is there any control over the orbit of the BIT telescope? It's a great question. So uh, first of all, we don't actually go high enough to, to technically be in orbit. So we're still in what's called the stratosphere. And there's very little control. So what happens is, is that you know, you're sort of subject to the winds uh, of, of the stratosphere to, to put you in location. So you don't actually know exactly uh, where you're going to go, but you, you have predictive software that tells you where you're probably going to go. And the way it works is, is you have, um, for safety purposes, you ensure that you fly over regions where you're not going to really be flying over anyone uh, because, you know, you, you can't really tell uh, or control the, the, the position of Superbit in the sky. It's a great question. Right, uh, next question is from Isabella Rivera. Are there more balloon-borne telescopes or is there just one? Oh, that's another great question. Uh, it's actually a whole program. There's many, many balloon-borne uh, missions. They do various things. So for example, even in our group alone, we, uh, my advisor has produced uh, many different missions. Uh, so so no, this is, this is not the only one. There, there, there are many, many different ones. Uh, but, you know, they don't all do the same thing. Some of them are, you know, not looking necessarily at visible light. Some of them are looking at, you know, microwave, which is a different type of light. They're like measuring the temperature of the sky. Um, there are telescopes that, you know, don't even do astronomy. There are ones, there's balloon missions that are, are dedicated to atmospheric sciences. 
But yeah, no, th this is not the only one, right? Uh, okay, so the next question we have is from Kevin Kwan, uh, and it's asked, how long does the telescope stay in the air once launched? Any thoughts on doing this in a more controlled manner so we can minimize the damage after each launch? That's another great question. Uh, so the test flights that I talked about were all one night. It's about you know 24-ish hours, give or take. And that's because all that's all you need to test your system. Uh, the science flight, which is you know planned to launch sometime in 2021 uh, out of Wanaka, New Zealand, is going to be somewhere between 30 to 100 nights, uh, and it's actually going to be over a um, uh, the ocean. So there's actually so talking about minimizing damage. Uh, there's they we're probably not even going to recover it, but that's fine because these experiment are experiments are fairly cheap especially by the scale of, uh, in comparison to the data they bring you. Uh, and we, uh, we, have, we have ways to extract the data before uh, the mission goes in the ocean. Uh, but, but basically, de depending, depending on the mission, there are some missions where you can actually minimize the damage and reuse the gondola, that's totally true. Uh, but is there a plan to do it in a more controlled manner? It's not actually very easy to control it, especially because you know, you're trying to be very stable up there. So anything that you put that would try like to propel you to control your, your location would potentially sabotage that to begin with. Uh, so for Superbit specifically, there are no plans to have a very controlled geographically uh, version in order to minimize damage. But also the damage is not that serious, right? We we're, we can fix up Superbit in a fairly short period of time and not for a lot of money. Uh, all right, next up we have, uh, a seven-year-old Rianch wants to know how you make the telescope. So it takes a lot of hard work from a lot of great people. We have a, a large team across multiple institutions that all work very hard together. And you know, the telescope is basically like a bunch of mirrors. And what those mirrors do is they reflect the light that's coming in from the sky and they aim it at a little camera, kind of like your phone camera. And then the camera just snaps the light and records an image. And you know that's that's the basis of how the telescope works. Uh, next up, there is a message, a question from Kyrielo Shigeta. Again, apologies if I'm butchering this name. Um, and the question is: Are there many current theories around the nature of dark matter or what dark matter is? Yes, there are many competing theories. Um, some that have been um, uh, sort of ruled out and some that are still in question. Uh, the, the, there are definitely a lot of unknowns when it comes to the nature of dark matter with regards to the particle nature. So there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of candidates both of like known particles or versions of known particles. Like for example, there are these, you know, particles called neutrinos and there's a flavor of it called right-handed neutrinos that people, uh, you know, think might exist. And if it exists, it could be, um, Dark, dark matter and uh, yeah, so, so there are there are a lot of uh, theories, but you know, none of them have been confirmed yet. A lot of them have been ruled out, but there are still many that haven't been ruled out and haven't been you know uh, supported with a lot of evidence yet. Okay, so uh, next up we have a question from uh, sorry, it's, uh, I have a lot of questions here from Rachel. Uh, my Domagalaski, again, sorry if I butchered the last name, even though I, I actually know this individual personally. Uh, have any balloon telescopes fallen out of the sky? Uh, it's not unheard of. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. It's not, it's, it's not unheard of, but, but there are a lot of safety precautions taken to ensure that if that happens, uh, no one gets hurt in the process. It's, it's uh, right. Next up, I have a question. Uh, from Ahmed Shaban, how does the balloon handle heavy winds on launch uh, or do you wait for perfect weather conditions? That's another great question. We, you actually do wait for, for fairly good weather conditions. We have, you know, on site during launch, we have meteorologists and, and weather experts. They give you weather briefings daily and uh, you have normally a launch window. You don't actually have a specific launch day. You say we're launching, you know, sometime between day, that day and that day. And during that window, you know, you meet with with the weather experts every single day. And once you get a perfect weather opportunity, then you launch. 
And you know, it's, it's not actually necessarily perfect. You just need it to be good enough. Right, we have a question from uh, uh, J for, uh, sorry. I think there's only one more question. So the superbit only target, yeah, so this is from Lauren Bradford. The superbit only target one part of the sky per launch. So, I mean, the answer is, is yes, uh, for many reasons. First of all, limited time. And second of all, uh, is because, I mean, you know, the earth is in the way, so you can't even look everywhere, right? There's, um, so, so if you don't, you know, do a full orbit around the earth in every way possible, you're not going to be able to see all the sky. So we do have a target list of specific locations in the sky that, you know, are, are more interesting than other, perhaps, that we uh, look at. Okay. Uh, all right, I think this is all the questions. Uh, at least these are all the questions that I've received. Um, yeah. Right, that's, I believe that's all. I, I'm, I'm gonna wait, I guess, five more minutes in case any anyone has any more questions. And if not, I, I'm probably gonna call it a day and end the stream. All right, there doesn't seem to be any more questions. Thank you everyone for coming. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you learned something new. Uh, I hope you have a good evening and uh, cheers, have a good day.